The storytellers of India sit under a banyan tree or beside the holy rivers and tell their wonderful stories. There's always a group of people around the storyteller. And the traditional offering, the traditional payment for the story is a piece of fruit. And the storyteller has a wonderful hold over his audience because if they haven't brought him enough to eat for that day, he talks so much under his voice like this <laughs> that they know they're not going to get an audible story till somebody goes off to the fruit market and gets him some more fruit. <laughs> <laughs> then everything goes well. And people have given me lots of fruit today. <laughs> the storytellers tell their tales and the most fascinating thing about it is that over just beside the storyteller is a little beady-eyed boy and he's sitting there. Maybe the storyteller's son. Maybe it's just somebody in the village who is so fascinated with stories he can't stay away. And he's hearing the stories. He's memorizing them. And when the old storyteller dies, this boy or youth would just move over two feet and continue the story where the storyteller left off. And that's how the stories are transmitted. The story I'm going to tell you tomorrow night is the best Indian story I know. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the tale I will tell you tonight is the next to the best story <laughs> that I know. <clears throat> tonight is a relatively short one. Tomorrow night is a longer one. Once there was a king, and though he was a young man, he was a very, very fine king. Everyone in his kingdom loved him. The kingdom prospered, and there were good times in that kingdom. Everyone was so grateful that they had a good king. The king did his business well. He was wise. He was humane. He was kind. You just couldn't wish for a better king. He had a fine wife, he had a wonderful harem, he had many servants, the palace was fine, the whole kingdom was a model of what a kingdom should be. Even with all of this, however, the king had some gnawing doubt in the back of his head, and he didn't know what this gnawing thing was that kept telling him there was something else that something was missing. So he added to his harem and he did more grandiose things with his kingdom and everyone was even more pleased but that had nothing to do with his gnawing doubt which was going on in the back of his head. If one will endure such a doubt for long enough the external form of it will come and announce itself or give you a hint or let you know or suggest something. And just in that manner, the king heard that there was an old, old wise man who taught in the forest on the other side of his kingdom. And the king knew instantly then that it was the wise man that he needed. He got his best procession going. There were many, many elephants. It took 400 cooks and waiters to make a, a proper procession like this, a progression as it's grandly called across the kingdom. And his soldiers went with him and his harem went with him and the queen went with him. And they were all of the dignitaries carried in palaquins the several day journey across the kingdom. Other wonderful things in this story, as with every good story, as with every dream, every detail is useful. So please don't miss the fact that when the king got near the forest, he got down from his palaquin and he walked the last distance to the holy man just out of deference to the holy man. 
any other king would have sent for the holy man and had audience with him in the palace. But not only did the king go to the holy man, but he walked the last distance of it. He arrived at the presence of the holy man and was struck, awestruck, nearly dumb, at the presence of the old man who sat only in his loincloth and with his begging bowl and a few people around him who had devoted their lives to the old holy man. He sat there and when someone of sufficient worth came, he would hear their problems or hear their request for teachings and he was famous for the shortness of his replies. Often it consisted of a single word. For the king bowed before the holy man, sat down in lotus position before him, let a suitable distance of time pass by. Timing is all in India. If you can understand the timing of something, you have made yourself known told your character and opened up an exchange which not w only will have content but will have timing which makes music of it. So the king waited a long time and then asked the holy man if he would impart some of his wisdom or give him instruction. And the king equally aware of timing waited an inconscionable long time, which the king quite understood, and the serenity of the afternoon was thoroughly established, when suddenly the holy man took a deep breath and roared forth a single word. Can you imagine the effect of this in the peace of the afternoon and everything quiet and waiting and serenity in every dimension? And the holy man took a deep breath and fairly roared out a single word, renunciation. And the holy man closed his eyes again and made it quite clear that that was the sum total of his advice. Now the king, nearly blown over backwards with this, after a suitable time again, Remember the timing of such moments. It's of great, great importance. Timing is so important that if somebody meets you in the hall and exercises proper timing in the exchange, he will tell you uh, in very short order, only the length of time necessary, who he is and the degree of dignity which he carries with him. Well, the king waited, and in the proper passage of time, got up, bowed, backed off, got in his palaquin, ordered the procession back to the royal palace again. He took the advice of the holy man, <clears throat> brief as it was, very, very seriously, as of course one should if you go to a holy man. The king thought for several days about this <clears throat> and finally issued a series of orders. He diminished the amount of food that he would eat each day. He simplified his clothing. He reduced his harem. He reduced the army. He dismissed a number of elephants, brought the expenditures of the royal palace down considerably, and proceeded on this regimen for a year. The kingdom prospered as never before. People were so pleased. Another facet of India is that everybody knows what everybody else has done. And so, of course, they knew that the king had gone to the holy man and that even greater dignity and greater wisdom prevailed in the royal palace. And they were very pleased for everything prospered as never before. After a year's time, the king decided that he wanted uh, further advice from the old holy man. So he went with a much smaller retinue. He took his queen, he only took a hundred uh, cooks and servants, and only a part of his uh, harem, only the most important ones. 
and he took only a portion of his army and it was a much less grandiose uh, progression which went across the kingdom that day for several days it was some distance so the king arrived got out of his palaquin went the last several hundred feet to the holy man on his own feet sat down and waited that wonderful length of time which really consists of the accumulation of energy for that's what timing is all about and after a suitable time the king was a master at this sense of timing asked for further instruction from the holy man the holy man after a suitable passage of time opened his eyes and fairly roared forth a single word again renunciation nearly blew the poor king off his feet so after a suitable time the king got up and bowed and left got in his palaquin and went home after a few days of meditation cut things down in the royal palace still further he ate even less he dressed more simply he cut his harem down to the bone fewer soldiers <clears throat> less talk just everything was reduced down renunciation was the order of the day and for a year the kingdom prospered even better than before everyone learning tremendous wisdom and a tremendous depth of insight from this fact that less is more at the end of a year the king knew urgently that he wanted nothing more than to go to the holy man again and find out what the next step of his life was to be so he went uh, very very simply he took only the queen no harem accompanied him and only enough few retainers just to manage the procession and only one elephant and the palaquin bearers and he made his progression across the kingdom he came to the old holy man who seemed not to have changed a particle sat himself down before the holy man waited that wonderful length of time of appropriateness <clears throat> finally asked the holy man again for further instruction and teaching and again that wonderful passage of time which is really the great hallmark of India and the holy man suddenly opened his eyes and took a deep breath and fairly roared forth a single word renunciation the king not too surprised this time <laughs> went back to the royal palace <clears throat> dismissed his harem entirely unheard of for a king ate only one meal a day of the simplest food saw only a few of the emissaries which came on royal business clothed himself very very simply and silence and austerity was the order of the palace well the kingdom prospered even better the king could hardly wait for a year that's a discreet uh, distance between teachings from a real holy man you know and he went on his own two feet with two companions at the end of the year found his way to the holy man who was still sitting there the king sat himself down before the holy man and after the long pause which is really the essence of virtue asked for further teaching from the holy man and the holy man this time waited an inconscionable long time much longer than before before he suddenly opened his eyes and roared forth a single word renunciation 
Well, the king really was set back on his heels this time because what further renunciation is possible? After a discreet time, he backed off a little and leaned against a tree. So what further renunciation could be made? He thought he was up against the bare bone now. No harem, one meal a day, <clears throat> no retainers, but he believed absolutely the old holy man. And he thought there's uh, only one more thing I can do. I can go over to the neighboring banyan tree and sit in meditation for the next year and eat of the bark and the fruits and the leaves of just whatever is available and keep one friend with me as companion and clothe myself from the bark of the trees, yes, uh, that would make a further renunciation. So he arranged for couriers to come once a week from the royal palace so he could conduct the necessary business to keep his kingdom going and set himself up under the low adjoining banyan tree as um, mendicant like the many others who were around. Well, he was particularly joyous for that year's time. It was a profoundly happy and interior time for him. And of course, the kingdom was buzzing with the news of all of this, but everyone observed that the kingdom, kingdom prospered even more than it had before. So no one was worried uh, about the uh, unwisdom of this. At the end of a year, the king uh, said, I will go again. But his voice caught in his throat as he said this, because what is the holy man going to do next? And of course, he would have to do it, whatever it is. So at the end of a year, he went the short distance over to his beloved holy man and put himself cross-legged before the old man and waited a um, very long time, partly in apprehension, partly in joyous anticipation, because each utterance of the holy man had brought something more profound and more joyful to the king. So finally, with trepidation, he asked for further instructions from the old holy man and the old man waiting that interminable length of time before he replied, opened his eyes and shouted forth one single word, renunciation. Well, the poor king, because he knew. There was only one more renunciation that is possible of a human being, and that is to renounce your own life. So he went over to his banyan tree, sat down, not to take food again until the end of his life. This was the, re the only renunciation that was left to him, or so he thought. In temper temperate climes, uh, one can manage about 60 days without food before he dies, give or take a little. But in the warmer lands of India, uh, not so long. So in less than a month, the king knew that he had arrived at the next to the last day of his life. And he wanted to see his beloved holy man one more time before uh, the end of his life and to express his happiness, for he had been more truly happy in that nearly 30 days than in all the rest of his life put together. He had himself carried, for he was very weak, over to the old holy man, and his friends had to prop him up because he was too weak even to sit erect. And he sat there for what drifted off into what must have been eternity itself, an eternity of joy, because it was samadhi 
experience for him. And suddenly, the old man opened his eyes and took a deep breath and fairly roared forth two words. Renounce renunciation. <laughs> Whereupon the king was enlightened, he suddenly saw what the ultimate renunciation is. He had himself carried back to the palace. He took food. He restored the glory of the palace back to its most opulent state. He restored his harem to full size. The uh, required number of elephants were restored. The army was brought to full size. Food was luxurious. Clothing was uh, of its most magnificent. And this young man, he was still a young man, became the greatest king in all of the history of India. Good night. <laughs>